Evelyn Zumaya reads Affairs Valentino. I am Evelyn Zumaya, the author of Affairs Valentino, and I want to read my book to you from page 300, chapter 15. The Son of the Sheik says goodbye. London, December 1925. As two more delivery trucks pulled up to the Italian hospital's kitchen door, the mother superior shook her head and muttered in Italian. She had no idea who ordered this quantity of goods, but she was doing her best to accommodate the stacks of crates and boxes in her tiny cramped kitchen. The perplexing deliveries continued to arrive at the small Catholic hospital on London's Queen Square throughout that chilly December afternoon. Boxes of Seville oranges, colorful tins of candy, toys of every description, and enough freshly baked Italian panettone to feed a hundred people. While the flustered nun wedged the heavy crates into every available space, she had yet to make the connection between the bounty of Christmas cheer and a handsome young man who stopped by the hospital earlier that day. In his tailored suit, He'd stood hat in hand in the hospital's foyer as he explained to the mother superior how he was searching for an address on Queen Square when he came across the Italian hospital. Was there anything, he asked, that he could do for the children's ward? The mother superior thanked the stranger and informed him the hospital was too poor to maintain a separate ward for children. She added they were simply cared for in the adult wards. Hearing this, the passerby wished the nun a buon Natale and left. She hadn't given their exchange a second thought. As she and several other curious nuns sorted through the crates stacked about the kitchen, they noticed a taxi cab pulling up to the kitchen door. Out stepped the same young man the mother superior spoke with earlier in the day. The sisters paused in their work to watch him bound into the kitchen with a great gold box under his arm. Surveying the crowded room, he confessed he had ordered the oranges, the toys, and the towers of fruitcakes. As the nuns stood dumbfounded, their visitor opened the gold box and shook out a brand new Santa suit. With no further explanation, he slipped the bright red suit over his own and strung the ends of the long white beard over his ears. They found him believable, despite a curious sleigh bracelet on his wrist and a profound scar creasing one cheek. After gathering up an armful of toy boats, soldiers, dolls, and candy, he headed down the hospital corridor towards the nearest ward. An entourage of excited nuns traipsed behind him, bringing up his rear with even more gifts. Santa's sudden appearance in the hospital ward triggered pandemonium. Adults who were not too ill to do so sat up and waved. Children jumped up and down in their beds and shrieked at pitch volume, and a few younger charges wailed in terror. For the next hour, Santa padded heads and ho-hoed his way through each ward. After returning to the hospital's kitchen, he stepped out of his crimson suit and stood in his street clothes to say goodbye. By this time, the nuns were frantic to know who he was, but he shook his head explaining, I should like to do this all without name. The sisters insisted he identify himself, but we want to pray for you. It was then that one of the younger nurses made the connection between the mysterious Santa and the movie posters advertising the opening of the movie, The Eagle. It's Rudolph Valentino, she gasped loudly enough for everyone in the kitchen to hear. Rudy flashed a look of concern her way and began pleading with the sisters to keep news of his visit a secret. I am able to do so little as a private person, and I would enjoy the memory of this all so much more if it could remain a private thing. The nuns were in no position to refuse Rudy any request, and they kept their promise made to him that day. News of his merry sweep through the Italian hospital could have been choice publicity for the eagle but instead was kept confidential for the next 30 years. That Christmas, Rudy was confident he was on the verge of becoming more than just a Santa Claus, Babbo Natale. If his petition to adopt his sole heir was approved, he would at last become Jean's father, his padre, his papa. While he was secretly playing Santa for a ward of infirm kitties, on the other side of the Atlantic, the editor of Photoplay magazine, 
James Quirk, was writing an article about movie star Rudolph Valentino for an upcoming issue. The Sheik's trip to London and his impending divorce in Paris had the media debating whether the Valentino's split resulted from Rudy's desire for children and Natasha's refusal to bear his offspring. Editor Quirk found it ridiculous that Rudy Valentino was somehow frustrated over his childless state. I have never heard of Mr. Valentino hanging around an orphan asylum, he wrote, and I cannot quite visualize the picture of the sheik walking the floor on a cold California night, crooning the junior to sleep. Divorce is no joking matter, but I cannot hold back a little snicker at Rudy's crying on the shoulders of the public and yearning for kitties, end quote. James Quirk was not alone in the dark about Rudolph Valentino, as there was a great deal the public did not know about their screen idol. Behind the public scenes, Rudy and George waged a continual battle to hold the line between his public image and private life. Fortunately for Rudy, with George's guard dog of that porous divide, success was more often the case. But George's efforts in this capacity were always daunting feats of long-distance management whenever Rudy traveled abroad. In these instances, it was necessary for George to dispatch daily cablegrams and frequent international money transfers from Rudy's account in the Wilshire National Bank in Los Angeles to his account in the Morgan Hage Bank in Paris. George's efforts were further complicated by Rudy's paranoia that their private business correspondence might be compromised. This required that their communiques be composed in Rudy's system of rotating codes. In November of 1925, Rudy's trip to New York and London to attend the premieres of The Eagle stretched George's transatlantic managerial skills to the limit. He did not accompany Rudy on this journey in order to remain in Los Angeles and receive the Italian court's imminent decision on Jean's adoption. In his stead, Rudy traveled with his and George's friend, the commercial attaché of the Los Angeles and San Francisco Mexican consulates, S. Manuel Ricci. It was George's idea to dispatch Manuel Ricci, as he believed his diplomatic expertise would serve Rudy well on the road. Ricci was the husband of Rudy's co-star in The Chic, Agnes Ayres, and at the time of the Eagle promotional tour, she was six months pregnant with the Ricci's first child. On the day of Rudy and Manuel Ricci's scheduled departure from Los Angeles, Agnes Ayres, George, and Rudy's anxious girlfriend, Paula Negri, waved goodbye from the Pasadena train station platform. They had no idea Rudy and Manuel were about to be away considerably longer than the scheduled few weeks. They would, in fact, be gone for so long Agnes Ayres later cited her husband's European trip with Rudolph Valentino in November of 1925 as proof of his desertion. Agnes Ayres would divulge a few other intimate details about Rudy's traveling companion when she divorced Manuel Ricci. She revealed to the court her husband possessed such a violent temper, on several occasions he attempted to strangle her, leaving finger marks on her neck. She testified he, quote, once threw her on the bed, causing her great physical and mental anguish, end quote. And when her maid attempted to intervene, he told her to, quote, shut up. Mrs. Ricci also lamented how the press referred to her handsome husband as a Latin lover and revealed his adulterous affairs with women were too well known to comment upon. But in November of 1925, George knew none of this, and had every reason to believe Signor Ricci was a solid citizen and businessman. He briefed Ricci for the journey and passed along detailed instructions regarding his role as Rudy's frontline attaché. While Rudy and Manuel Ricci were en route to New York, Natasha was returning from France. Rudy arrived in New York only a few days before his estranged wife and just in time for the opening of The Eagle at the Mark Strand Theater. The film's New York debut became a logistical nightmare when thousands of his fans converged upon the theater in the hopes of catching a glimpse of the great lover. The morning papers referred to the melee outside the Mark Strand as a, quote, stampede of Rudy's fans. 
but critics declared the Eagle a hit and lauded the return of Rudolph Valentino as an action hero. Rudy wasted no time handing the New York press more fodder for gossip when he arrived at a matinee showing of the Eagle with actress Mae Murray on his arm. New Yorkers whispered fling and wondered if Rudy might wed May when his divorce from Natasha was declared final. Rudy insisted he and May were only friends, but in Hollywood his pining sweetheart, Pola Negri, kept one green eye glued on all reports of her wandering lover's activities. Natasha shipped off to New York the day after the Eagle premiere and the press pursued both Mr. and Mrs. Valentino with questions about a possible reconciliation. During the next few days, Rudy and Natasha's paths nearly crossed by a few city blocks, but neither made the slightest effort to contact each other. On November 10th, Rudy made a brief appearance in the federal building where he applied for U.S. citizenship, and a few days later he boarded the ocean liner the Leviathan with Manuel Ricci to sail for London. In the first of what Rudy would brush off as mere coincidences, May Murray also left New York for Europe on the same day, on another ocean liner only a few slips away. As the Leviathan steamed down the Hudson River and Rudy settled into his stateroom for the crossing, news of his application for American citizenship wended its way towards Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. El Duce was about to be molto infelice to learn of Signor Valentino's expatriating activities and would level a swift response usually bestowed upon enemies of the state. On November 23rd, the Eagle premiered at London's Marble Arch Pavilion and a battalion of bobbies locked arms to restrain Rudy's faithful chanting the familiar refrain, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. When the object of their hysteria stepped from his limousine, the faltering police line ruptured. In the surge of screaming women, flying handbags, high heels, and cloche hats, Rudy abandoned any pretense of a poised debut and sprinted for the safety of the theater lobby. The London press gave the Eagle rave reviews and greeted the Sheik with columns of sympathetic coverage concerning his marital woes. In Rudy's first public statement in London, he admitted that perhaps the rift with his wife had been because he was just an old-fashioned husband who wanted children. Quote, should I try again to find me a wife, he explained, and let me find one who wishes to have children, who when she has had them, wishes to care for them. During his week-long stay in London, Rudy wired his brother Alberto in Italy to tell him he had just purchased passage to London for him, his wife Otta, young Jean, and their sister Maria. Rudy explained he would be in Paris for the next few weeks, but would return to London in plenty of time to join them there for the holidays. He then boarded the boat train with Manuel Ricci and headed for France. After checking into the Hotel Plaza Athene in Paris, Rudy filed for his divorce and then boarded another train bound for Berlin, where he happened to run into May Murray. Although May and Rudy continued to toy with the press by claiming they were just old friends, they made no effort to conceal the fact they both registered at Berlin's Hotel Adlon near the Brandenburg Gate. Rudy and May's low-profile getaway to Berlin was not to be, as Rudy's presence in Germany stirred up more than his female fans. Members of the National Socialist Party held citywide demonstrations upon his arrival, protesting the denigrating portrayal of German officers in his film The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. To avoid this political furor, Rudy and May left Berlin and secluded themselves in a first-class stateroom on a train traveling south to the French Riviera. Upon the arrival on the Côte d'Azur, Rudy paid a brief visit to the Hudnut Chateau. There, Muzzy consoled her soon-to-be ex-son-in-law, as he reportedly broke down and sobbed in her arms. While Rudy paid his respects to the Hudnuts, May Murray bided her time down the road in Nice. She and Rudy were soon on the train again traveling north to Paris. Rudy then hurried off to London for the holidays and arrived just in time to play Santa one afternoon at the Italian hospital on Queen's Square. 
While Rudy was crisscrossing the English Channel, a half a world away, Joe Schenk and George Allman were monitoring a troubling situation in Italy. Mussolini had just declared Rudolf Valentino's application for U.S. citizenship an act of treason and issued an official boycott of his movies. With Rudy fast becoming a bullseye for the militant Italian fascisti, George dispatched an urgent wire to London. He informed Rudy that as his divorce was already filed, it was time to curtail his trip and return to Los Angeles. George had another reason for demanding Rudy's immediate return. After sorting through Rudy's bills, he realized this jaunt was no longer a publicity tour for the Eagle, but Manuel Ricci's Toot Royale entirely funded by Rudy. Frustrated, George continued to wire Rudy with news of the developing situation in Italy and admonishments to be more frugal. In London, Rudy steamed at Mussolini's reaction to his bid for U.S. citizenship and attempted to appease the irate dictator by sending him a lengthy personal letter. Despite Rudy's impassioned declaration of fidelity to his country of birth, Mussolini remained unmoved and dispatched his fascisti minions throughout Italy to confiscate all of Rudolf Valentino's films. The name Rudolf Valentino was removed from every theater marquee, and all periodicals with any reference to the movie star were heaved into boxes. Any image of the previous Signor Valentino, now Mr. Valentino, vanished from his homeland overnight. While Rudy celebrated Christmas in London with Alberto, Ada, Maria, and Jean, in Milan, on the Piazza San Pietro, a paperback book titled Rudolfo Valentino, a passionate expose against the renouncer of our country, appeared on newsstands. The fascisti publication referred to Rudy as a miserable renegade, an indignant citizen who had revoked his origins and itemized in detail his, quote, atrocious offenses to all Italians. Despite this mounting political uproar and George's many cablegrams imploring him to sail home immediately after Christmas, Rudy left London with Manuel Ricci and instead returned to Paris. To George's consternation, Ricci hardly turned out to be a sobering influence on Rudy, and the invoices from their nightly escapades proved this fact. The two men were regular attendees of La Revue Negra at the Théâtre Champs-Élysées, where they cheered and whistled at the show's opening number, a bottomless Josephine Baker being carried on stage while performing an upside-down split on the shoulders of her partner, Joe Alex. It was nightly revelry in exclusive clubs and restaurants, where Rudy rang up outrageous charges, hosting private dinner parties all capably organized by Manuel Ricci. While George opened the invoices for these exorbitant fets, a portrait of Rudy dressed as the chic was removed from the lobby of Milan's largest theater. Word of this anti-Valentino uprising prompted Joe Schenk to remind George of United Artists' investment in Rudy's next film, The Son of the Chic, which was scheduled to begin production upon his safe return. Nevertheless, Rudy and Manuel arrived in Paris after the holidays and began charging more liquor tabs and signing for more restaurant charges, haberdashery services, and the purchase of antique armor, silver, and jewelry. In Hollywood, George Ullman was having conniptions. The threat to Rudy's personal safety posed by the fascista boycott was further compounded in Paris, by his fanatical female fans. Unlike their semi-restrained English counterparts, the women of Paris were so obsessed with Rudy, he could seldom venture forth during daylight hours. It was during this time he initiated a routine of sleeping through the day in order to slip past his fans and the Parisian press late at night. He knew if word leaked out that he was on the move, the encampments in the Hotel Athenay's lobby would mobilize in pursuit of their quarry. His female fans were persistent as they grabbed at him to wrest any souvenir, with the press equally as unrelenting as they shouted questions his way. Most of these questions concerned his plans about Miss May Murray. May was not the only beauty draped on Rudy's arm in Paris that January. 
he was spotted in the company of several Parisian showgirls, and one notable companion, a tall, blonde British royal, Lady Sheila Lauborough. It didn't take long for the reportage of Rudy's nocturnal dalliances to reach Pola Negri's burning ears. If she was almost sure May and Rudy were just friends, she was not as convinced when it came to Lady Lauborough. Along with George and a very pregnant Agnes Ayres, Pola Negri urgently wanted Rudy and Manuel Ricci to return home to Los Angeles. This was emphatically the case after she read all the details of how Rudy and Lady Lauborough danced until dawn in a Parisian jazz club, downed quantities of expensive champagne and beer, and won first prize in the club's dance contest. Undaunted by this news, Pola upped her ante by informing her friends that she was, in fact, engaged to marry Rudy. In Paris, he was doing his best to prove otherwise. It was night after night of easy conquests, and May Murray, calmly British royalty in a backlog of fawning showgirls all waiting for their turn on his arm. No matter how adamantly Pola Negri claimed to be Rudy's fiance, he had just filed for his divorce from Natasha and was bearing down on bachelorhood with all the restraint of a recently released convict. On January 18, 1926, the Tribunal of the Seine heard arguments in the Valentino's divorce, and although neither Natasha nor Rudy attended the hearing, their divorce was granted without objection. By then, Rudy and Manuel Ricci had returned to London, where Rudy informed his brother that young Jean would be traveling home with him to California. As soon as George received the urgent wire from Rudy, he booked passage for not only Jean, but for Alberto and his wife, Ada, as well. The entire Guglielmi family then sailed for America, and on January 27th, they greeted the New York City press. And photos snapped upon their arrival. Rudy appeared uncharacteristically exhausted as he told the reporters he was enjoying his restoration to bachelorhood. At his side, tucked protectively under his arm, was his spitting image, 11-year-old Jean. Pola Negri welcomed her fiancé home to Falcon Lair with a swift slap across the face. She guessed he had it coming for his time not well spent with Lady Lowborough. But within minutes of Pola's strike, she and Rudy picked right up where they left off the previous November, in Falcon Lair's master bedroom. To house guest Alberto and his devoutly Catholic wife's horror, Rudy's Polish mistress practically moved in. In a move that would have raised every eyebrow in their provincial hometown in southern Italy, Pola placed a framed photo of herself on Rudy's dresser, tossed her delicates in his dresser drawers, and hung more negligees in his bedroom closet. Her brazen sleepovers triggered morning wars between the brothers Valentino, and their thunderous voices rocked the house from one end to the other. Rudy did little to accommodate his brother's objections and continued to do exactly as he pleased. This not only included sleeping with Pola Negri, but devoting a great deal of his time to ensuring Jean be the most pampered 11-year-old in Beverly Hills. He outfitted the boy in full riding gear and ordered him a pair of custom-made black leather riding boots to match his own favorite pair. If Rudy and Jean were not on horseback riding along the firebreak roads behind Falcon Lair, they could be found covered in grease in Rudy's fully equipped garage. There, Rudy delivered lengthy instructions to the attentive child on the complex maintenance of the Voisin Roadster. Fan magazines devoted full coverage to Rudy's return to the States with his family, to his upcoming film The Son of the Sheik, and to his love affair with Pola Negri. Any news of Rudy and Pola made for spicy copy. But behind the scenes, Rudy was competing for Pola's attentions with Sergei Midivani. Sergei Midivani and his brother David were recent arrivals in Los Angeles and alleged to be displaced Russian princes. Unknown to Pola Negri and the rest of Hollywood at the time, the brothers Midvani had not recently abandoned some musty romantic castle on the Baltic Sea, but a couple of unglorious positions as roustabouts on a Sinclair oil field in Oklahoma. 
Nevertheless, Princess Serge and David cleaned up remarkably well and deftly seduced their way into Hollywood's elite social circles by wielding their thick Russian accents and newly minted family seal with a vengeance. While Pola Negri was being seen with Rudolf Valentino, she was also seeing a great deal of the dashing Prince Serge. Her clumsy efforts to juggle her two suitors, her flash temper, and Rudy's incorrigible unfaithfulness made the future of the Valentino-Negri relationship as vague as it was volatile. In between photo ops at such glamorous settings as Marion Davies Beach House and the Sixty Club, Pola and Rudy floundered through a classic love-hate. At home, Rudy's relationship with his brother wasn't faring much better. Life under the same red-tile roof as Alberto became so contentious, Rudy counted the days until he and George could leave for Arizona to begin filming The Son of the Sheik. While he anticipated their departure, Rudy avoided his heady home fires by continuing to imbibe excessively in bootleg whiskey and spin out of Falcon Lair's driveway on a series of spontaneous road trips which resulted in more vehicular disasters than George could keep under wraps. His spectacular wreck of his Isotta Fraccini limousine on the railroad tracks south of San Francisco sparked a rash of reprimand from the press in Los Angeles. This public outrage in response to his reckless behavior provoked Joe Schenck to draw up an addendum to Rudy's contract. The document stated that until production of The Son of the Sheik terminated, Rudolf Valentino was not permitted to drive himself anywhere. If he did get behind the wheel, Schenck contractually forbid him to drive over 50 miles per hour. Rudy could have cared less and continued crumpling his cars and racking up more speeding tickets. His enjoyment of his restoration to bachelorhood was apparently not solely a European activity. During the days before Rudy began work in The Son of the Sheik, George recorded weekly payments in Falcon Lair's expense ledgers to the local police for a string of Rudy's traffic citations. The ledgers also revealed business was booming for Falcon Lair's bootleggers, as Rudy's liquor tabs skyrocketed from hundreds of dollars a month prior to his recent trip abroad to thousands of dollars a month after his return to Los Angeles. It appeared that when he wasn't intoxicated and speeding along California's highways, Rudy was at home locking horns with his brother Alberto. On many occasions, these arguments were fueled with top-shelf liquors and vintage wines and instigated by Alberto's demands for money. Alberto found Rudy's lavish Hollywood lifestyle a sweet fit. And upon his arrival in February of 1926, he cashed weekly checks of $500 drawn upon Rudy's personal Wilshire National Bank account. George issued the checks to Alberto while overseeing Rudy's other daily expenditures with the wild-eyed desperation of a captain of a sinking ship. He held absolute authority over the management of Falcon Lair's finances and staff, but had no control over the spending habits and rash behavior of the often absent and increasingly inebriated young master at the helm. While George did his best to curb expenses, Manuel Ricci was doing his best to convince Rudy that George Ullman was far too conservative with his cash. It was true that Rudy was often drinking heavily and resenting his manager's attempts to tighten the purse strings. As tempers flared, Ricci sensed opportunity and pressed Rudy, saying he was sure he could do a better job as his business manager. But Rudy and George knew one fact that Manuel Ricci was not aware of at the time. By the spring of 1926, Rudy was over $200,000 in debt. The private world of Rudolf Valentino, which is public envisioned to be as professionally groomed and manicured as his studio photographs and slick fan magazine copy, was fraying under the strain of his enormous debt, reckless alcoholism, and the escalating conflicts within his household. Rudy was increasingly delegating the care of his horses and dogs to the groomsmen and the maintenance of his fleet of cars to Lou Mahoney, and his brother Charles. His interest in renovating Falcon Lair waned 
and his yacht, which he previously maintained in peak mechanical condition, suffered breakdowns. On one evening jaunt to Catalina with B and George, the boat's engines sputtered and died, leaving the craft and its passengers drifting until daylight before they were finally spotted and towed into port. There was, however, one subject which held Rudy's full attention, the son of the sheik. It was a tough sale for George to convince Rudy to have another go at sheikdom. Rudy abhorred the moniker sheik, especially when the word was used to imply wolfing and lecherous behavior. Just before leaving for the Eagle premiere in London the previous fall, he vowed to one reporter he would never again play that loathsome character. On the eve of what would become an epic three-month European bender of champagne, beer, showgirls, and luxurious hotel rooms, Rudy told a reporter, quote, Heaven knows I'm no chic. All the time I was a farmer at heart, and I still am. When I am working, I go to bed at 9.30 and I get up at 5. I am through with chicing. If any producer comes to me with a chic part, I'm going to murder him, end quote. The visage of Rudolph Valentino as an early-to-bed farmer rising at the crack of dawn to till his five acres spread in Beverly Hills uh, made for great press. But two compelling factors brought Rudy to his senses. The stack of unpaid bills on his manager's desk and news that Joe Shanks signed George Fitzmaurice as Son of the Sheik's director. Jesse Lasky's rejection of George Fitzmaurice as director of Blood and Sand contributed in great measure to Rudy's riff with famous players Lasky in 1922. The son of the Sheik would prove Rudy correct in his belief that he would work well with the French-speaking director. Son of the Sheik promised to be a challenging role for Rudy as he would play the dual role of the young Sheik and his aging father. Audiences were about to witness Rudy's on-screen brush with old age, in his convincing portrayal of the bearded, gray-haired elder Sheik. And in contrast to famous players Lasky's penny-pinching on the production of the original film, The Sheik, United Artists spared no expense producing The Son of the Sheik. All of Rudy's extravagant purchases of gilt-edged Sheik accoutrement were approved, including a $4,000 antique sword and a $3,000 sapphire ring. Rudy's love interest in The Son of the Sheik would again be played by his Eagle co-star, Vilma Banke, and the role of the aging Sheik's wife was reprised by Agnes Ayres. Ayres had just given birth to a daughter a few weeks before her scenes were filmed, and her husband Manuel had abandoned his career as a diplomat to accept a position as personal assistant to Son of the Sheik's director, George Fitzmaurice. On location in Yuma, Arizona, director Fitzmaurice and Rudy collaborated on every detail of production. The same Arabian stallion Jaden, used in the Sheik, was transported from Pomona, California, for a second performance in the Son of the Sheik, and desert sand dunes were whipped into violent sandstorms with strategically placed airplane engines. The infernal sandblasting and 100-degree Arizona heat resulted in a grueling work experience for everyone on location. Everyone except the star of the movie. For Rudy, the searing inconvenience was balmy relief in comparison to his Beverly Hills home front. For word finally arrived from Italy with the long-awaited news of Jean's adoption. And just as George anticipated, the Italian courts summarily rejected Rudy's petition. Rudy was devastated when he heard the news. From the moment he learned his sole heir would never be his legal son, any lingering civility towards his brother Alberto hardened into contempt. Bitterly disappointed, Rudy turned the focus of his days from fight to flight, and to George's dismay he weighed radical options for his future. During Rudy's final days in Arizona on the set of The Son of the Sheik, he confided in George that he was sick of playing the romantic lover. He swore he would soon work only behind a camera as a director. He lamented to George at length how he had lost all interest in acting and wanted to set plans in motion to purchase a home in Spain where he would study the art of bullfighting. George listened patiently and reminded Rudy he still had many obligations in Los Angeles. 
As soon as the final location scenes in Arizona were filmed, Rudy and George returned to Los Angeles, only to discover that in their absence, Alberto had been waging war with Falcon Lair's staff. He had just ordered the installation of padlocks on all of the refrigerators in order to prevent the hired hands from eating his food. Appeasing the disgruntled staff was not George and Rudy's only immediate concern upon their return. With the son of the sheik headed into post-production, Rudy had fulfilled his contractual obligations with United Artists, and his paychecks ceased. His legions of creditors from Los Angeles, New York, London, and Paris were well aware of this inevitable day, and with this in mind, George turned his attentions to securing Rudy's future income. As a band-aid on the hemorrhaging financial situation, George negotiated a stopgap $150,000 one-year loan at 7% interest from the Cinema Finance Corporation. In order to secure the loan, George was required to post nearly all of Rudy's real property and assets as collateral. With the Cinema Finance Company's check in hand, George paid off Rudy's loudest creditors. However, the loan's monthly payment of $13,375 only increased the pressure on George. In addition to this steep monthly payment, Rudy was also responsible to pay the monthly premium on a $125,000 life insurance policy purchased on his valuable self by the Cinema Finance Company. Rudy was no different than any other 31-year-old and perceived the life insurance policy required to secure the loan as nothing more than annoying paperwork. But George was about to make only three payments on the life insurance policy before it would have to be cashed in. George delayed contacting Joe Shank to pitch a new contract for Rudy in the hope Shank would make the first move. During this standoff, George met with William Fox, the president of Fox Films, and Carl Limley of Universal Pictures to discuss a possible deal for Rudy. Fox told George he could ill afford to produce Rudy's pictures as the cost of producing a movie at Fox Films was seldom more than $35,000 a picture. At Universal, Carl Limley gave George the same response. But George would not waver. He was adamant Rudy received no less than $150,000 a film, in addition to a percentage of the profits. A few days after meeting with Fox and Lemley, George received a telephone call from Joe Shank's assistant, John Considine. Considine set up a meeting between Shank and George in which Shank explained he had no intention of offering Rudy a second contract under the generous terms of the last. He claimed box office receipts from the Eagle did not merit such a large payment to Rudy. George knew those box office numbers and argued to the contrary. He presented Shank with his final offer, $6,500 a week for two more pictures plus 25% of their profits. He then stormed out of Shank's office on a bluff after warning him not to sit too long on his decision because Rudy had several other offers on the table. George knew Rudy was visiting Pola Negri at the time and drove directly from his meeting with Shank to her home. There, he explained to Rudy that under no circumstance was he to speak with Shank or Considine if they tried to contact him that evening. George then drove home, and just as he sat down to dinner, his telephone rang. It was John Considine with Shank's counteroffer, $3,500 a week and 10% of the profits. George snapped at Considine, saying Rudy would be insulted by those terms. Nevertheless, he said he would relay the offer to him anyway. George then drove back to Pola Negris to explain the details of Shank's offer to Rudy and advise that he reject it. Pola overheard their exchange and told George she thought Rudy had no other option but to accept the offer because he might be out of work for a long time. Rudy cut her off mid-sentence. It is entirely up to George, and he will decide what to do. George reiterated to Rudy that he not communicate with Shanker Considine and drove home once again. He then placed a telephone to Considine to tell him Rudy would not budge from his original numbers, and in fact he had been deeply offended by Shank's offer. With a heavy heart, George sat down to his cold dinner, 
wondering if he'd ruined any possible deal for Rudy with United Artists. About 10 o'clock that night, the Omen's telephone rang again. It was John Considine. I think he's crazy, but Mr. Shanks said that we should accept your terms for the new contract. Before George hung up the telephone, he confirmed with Considine that Rudy's $6,500 a week salary would commence immediately upon his signing the contract. George then made one more trek to Pola Negri's home. When he entered Pola's foyer on that occasion, he witnessed a scene he would never forget. With her head thrown back in high indignation, Pola was stomping up her front stairs while a furious Rudy seethed at her from the living room below. As George began relating the terms of the new contract, he sensed the volatile situation and gave Rudy a quick pat on the back, saying, It's time to get out of here. George had witnessed the repercussions of Rudy's boiling point many times and repeated, Rudy, let's get the hell out of here. As George began edging him towards the front door, Rudy turned around to lean against the stair railing and yell up at top volume, You bitch! Rudy signed his second contract with United Artists on May 22nd and his first movie under this contract was scheduled to be The Firebrand, a screenplay based on the life of the Italian sculptor Benvenuto Cellini. Production on Firebrand was not scheduled to begin until October. As soon as Rudy signed the contract, his United Artists paychecks resumed, and George was able to keep his creditors and the cinema finance company at bay. While Rudy returned to work by meeting with Firebrand's writers and preparing for the Son of the Sheik's impending premieres, Pola Negri turned up the volume on her campaign to become Mrs. Valentino No. 3. By the end of June, she was immersed in wedding planning. Not her own nuptials, but those of her other beau, Prince Sergei Midvani's brother David, to May Murray. Despite the fact that May was 14 years older than David Midvani, the recent marriage of her ex-husband, director Robert Leonard, as well as Paula Negri's insistence that she was Rudy's fiancée, sent May scurrying to the altar. Whether Paula was blind to Rudy and May's love affair, or calculating that by rushing May down the aisle she would have her out of the picture forever, was anyone's guess. George knew the truth of Rudy's simultaneous involvement with both women, and wisely kept mum on the uncomfortable subject. He also knew Rudy resented his Russian competition as Pola's continental ideal beau. For this reason, he was stunned to learn Rudy complied with Pola and May's wishes on the sunny afternoon of June 29th. On that day, Rudy acted as best man when his two lovers, Bride May and Maid of Honor Pola, convened for the holy Midvani matrimony. When George saw the first copies of the Midvani's wedding photos, with Rudy wedged between May and Pola, he could only cringe at the awkward predicament. On July 8th, one week after May's wedding, the Son of the Sheik opened at Grauman's Million Dollar Theater in Hollywood. Rudy and Pola attended the gala opening in the company of Hollywood luminaries, including columnist Luella Parsons, Charlie Chaplin, June Mathis, May Murray, and her new husband, Prince David. Although the Son of the Sheik was soundly hailed by critics and fans as Rudy's most solid performance to date, by sharp contrast, his private life was in a state of turmoil. It was around the time of the Grauman's opening when Rudy evicted his brother from Falcon Lair. While George was making plans for his and Rudy's scheduled trip east for the Son of the Sheik's premieres, Rudy asked him to book passage for Alberto and his family's return trip to Italy. Rudy specifically requested George time Alberto's departure for Italy with his own stay in New York City. The terminal strife between the Valentino brothers was not the only disruptive force contributing to the growing malaise in Rudy's household that summer. When Lou Mahoney heard the scuttlebutt that Manuel Ricci was aspiring to unseat George as Rudy's business manager, the handyman made his move. He approached Rudy and put a word in for Ricci's ascendancy. He informed Mr. Valentino that he felt the household was continually short on cash because Mr. Omen was stealing it. 
as a result of Lou Mahoney's sore underestimation of Rudy's faith in his stalwart manager. He would end up with the axe instead of George. Despite pressure from Ricci and Mahoney to fire George, Rudy stood by his friend and manager. He listened calmly to Lou and then went straight to George with instructions that he fire Lou Mahoney as well as his brothers George and Charles. It was just prior to leaving Los Angeles with Rudy that George faced off with the Irish ex-cop and spelled it out for him. While he and Rudy were in New York, he was to seek other employment. It was shortly before leaving for the East Coast that Rudy's Son of the Sheik co-star Vilma Banky convinced him to accompany her for a consultation with a psychic reader in Santa Monica. The reader's name was Dr. George Darios, and he was well known for his ability to recognize a person's previous lives by the way they walked. Rudy was anxious to hear what the noted psychic had to say, and expected nothing but glowing encouragement from the other side. But he and Vilma would abruptly leave the reading only after a few minutes, when Dr. Darius predicted Rudy's imminent death. July 14th was Rudy's last day at home in Falcon Lair. He puttered around the house, worked on his cars, and late that afternoon he loaded his luggage into one of those vehicles and asked Alberto to drive him to Pola Negri's home. There Pola joined the two brothers and they all continued on to the train station where they met B and George Ullman. On this occasion, George would be accompanying Rudy on the trip east. They said their goodbyes, and George and Rudy boarded the evening train north along the California coast. The following morning, they were welcomed to San Francisco by the city's Mayor Rolf, who presented Rudy with the gift of a pedigreed black water spaniel. Realizing the July heat would make the journey to New York unbearable for the dog, Rudy arranged for the animal to be driven back to Falcon Lair's kennels. Before parting with his newest pet, he posed for a few photographs and named the affectionate pup Mission Rudy. In the days before air conditioning, midsummer train travel was not for the faint-hearted, and like most other passengers, Rudy survived the heat of the journey by sleeping. But any similarities between Rudy and his fellow passengers went no further than his long naps. While his public perspired in cramped coach cars only a few feet away, Rudy was shielded from any undue discomfort in luxury accommodation. George ensured that all his favorites were stocked in sufficient supply for the cross-country trek. Bottled Vichy water, flasks of Canadian Scotch whiskey, cartons of Abdullah cigarettes, cans of Russian caviar, and to quell his chronic indigestion, boxes of bicarbonate of soda. If Rudy wasn't passing the time sound asleep, he was rambling on about a subject George had long since learned to be one of his favorite topics himself. In the privacy of his sleeper compartment, Rudy fretted over his thinning hair and his new toupee and mused to George that he believed he was finally ready to apply himself and get that formal education. As the train rocked along the rails, he whiled away the miles of countryside, expressing his profound guilt over his mother. He lamented how she died before he became a star, and how he had shamed her and his family as a teenager before he left Italy. Although Rudy could fret with the best, he did not worry long about psychic Dr. Darius's doom saying. George, on the other hand, did. With growing concern, he noticed Rudy was sleeping far too much. He found it unusual Rudy could barely be coaxed into making more than a few whistle-stop appearances on local platforms to greet his fans and press. George was also increasingly alarmed by Rudy's propensity to down an entire flask of scotch whiskey before he could fall off to sleep. One warm evening during the train's layover in St. Louis, Missouri, George arranged for a private dinner for Rudy and himself in a local restaurant. In a ballroom below their private dining room, a group of factory workers were holding a banquet. When word spread Rudolph Valentino was having his dinner upstairs, an emissary was appointed to request that the movie star make an appearance. The nervous messenger was greeted by an unusually magnanimous Rudy, who said he'd been enjoying the music from the ballroom during his meal 
and would be happy to come downstairs and even dance for them. The messenger rushed downstairs to alert the musicians, who rustled up a tango just as Rudy made his entrance. To the crowd's cheers, whistles, and wilting, Rudy strolled into the ballroom. He gave the crowd a nod as he selected his dancing partner, the most plainly dressed woman in the room. As he bowed low and took her hand, her face shot crimson. Before she could close her mouth or straighten her dress, she was twirling across the dance floor. It was an all-too-brief spin in Rudolph Valentino's arms. And before the starry-eyed woman knew what had happened, Rudy glided across the dance floor to return her to her seat. Rudy and George were soon boarding the train once again to head north to Chicago. As they fought to stay cool in the oppressive heat of their private car, neither of them realized they were steaming directly into the crosshairs of an enemy in wait. Over their morning coffee at the Hotel Blackstone in Chicago, George read an anonymous editorial in the Chicago Tribune and then tossed the paper across the table to Rudy. For the rest of his life, George Allman would regret ever having done so. Rudy suffered through his share of denigrating tirades directed at him over the years, but this particular piece was about to devastate his day, his next week, and each and every one of his few remaining days on earth. Like a soldier working his way through a Dear John letter from home, Rudy stiffened as his eyes moved down the page. The anonymous author of the editorial was in an uproar over the appearance of pink powder dispensing machines in a few men's rooms around Chicago. It read in part, quote, A powder vending machine and a men's washroom, homo americanus. Why didn't someone quietly drown Rudolfo Guglielmi, alias Valentino, years ago? It is time for a matriarchy, if the male of the species allows such things to persist. Better a rule by masculine women than by effeminate men. End quote. The writer went on to lay all blame for these powder machines on Rudy. Quote, How does one reconcile masculine cosmetics, sheiks, floppy pants, and slave bracelets with a disregard for the law and aptitude for crime? Chicago may have its powder puffs, London has its dancing men, and Paris its gigolos. Hollywood is the national school of masculinity. Rudy, the beautiful gardener's boy, is the prototype of the American male, end quote. By the time Rudy set the newspaper down on the table, George could see his reaction and sought to downplay the situation. He insisted Rudy not give the despicable article a second thought, but he could see the words cut deep and that being referred to as an effeminate role model and having his father's name raked through the mud was more than Rudy could bear. Within minutes, Rudy instructed George to telephone the Chicago Tribune's arch-rival, the Chicago Herald Examiner, to inform the paper that his response would be ready for publication in their next day's edition. It read as follows, quote, To the man, question mark, who wrote the editorial entitled, Pink Powder Puffs, in the Chicago Tribune. The above-mentioned editorial is at least the second scurrilous personal attack you have made upon me, my race, and my father's name. You slur my Italian ancestry. You cast ridicule upon my Italian name. You cast doubt upon my manhood. I call you in return a contemptible coward, and to prove which of us is the better man, I challenge you to a personal contest. This is not a challenge, but a duel in the generally accepted sense that would be illegal. But in Illinois, boxing is legal. So is wrestling. I therefore defy you to meet me in the boxing or wrestling arena to prove, in typically American fashion, for I am an American citizen, which of us is more of a man. I prefer this test of honor to be private, so I may give you the beating you deserve, because I want to make it absolutely plain this challenge is not for the purposes of publicity. I am handing copies of this to the newspapers simply because I doubt that anyone so cowardly as to write about me as you have done would respond to a challenge unless forced to by the press. I do not know who you are or how big you are, but this challenge stands if you are as big as Jack Dempsey. 
I will meet you immediately, or give you a reasonable time in which to prepare, for I assume that your muscles must be flabby and weak, judging by your cowardly mentality, and that you will have to replace the vitriol in your veins with red blood, if there be a place in such a body as yours for red blood and manly muscle. I welcome the criticism of my work as an actor, but I will resent with every muscle in my body attacks upon my manhood and ancestry. Hoping that I will have an opportunity to demonstrate to you that a wrist under a sleigh bracelet may slap a real fist into your sagging jaw, and that I may teach you respect of a man even though he prefers to keep his face clean. I remain with utter contempt, Rudolph Valentino. P.S. I will return to Chicago within ten days. You may send your answer to me in New York, care of the United Artists Corporation. End quote. When the author of the editorial offered no immediate response to this public challenge, Rudy became unhinged. On the final leg of the trip east to New York, he drank more than his usual excess and was racked with persistent bouts of indigestion. He was inconsolable and told George he worried that to those who did not know him personally, the label of effeminate just might stick. When George asked him what he would do if the author of the editorial turned out to be seven feet tall and weighed twice his weight, Rudy snapped back. If I'm licked by a more powerful man, that will be no disgrace, and at any rate I'll show him that I'm no pink powder puff. By the time Rudy and George checked into their suite in New York's Ambassador Hotel, the mercury was inching into the triple digits, and news of Rudolph Valentino's challenge to the author of the Chicago Tribune editorial was reaching pitch media hysteria. George tried valiantly to talk Rudy down off his ledge by arguing he was in no physical condition to enter a boxing ring with an unknown opponent. Unable to convince Rudy to let the issue slide, George turned to Frank Manillo. As Rudy's oldest and closest friend in New York, George hoped he would be able to prevent the hell-bent Rudy from pounding the life out of his opponent in Chicago or having the life pounded out of him. Frank assured George he would see what he could do and sat down to dinner with Rudy. Fourteen years Rudy's senior, Frank Manillo felt fatherly solicitude for the friend he'd helped out so many times over the years. So when Rudy persisted in a furious rant about his impending fight with the Tribune writer, Frank made every effort to change the subject. He told Rudy about his recent purchase of five acres in the San Joaquin Valley in California and his plans to build a tomato juice cannery on the property. He also boasted how his son Arnold would be returning to California with him to operate the plant. But Frank could see Rudy was distracted and suffering considerably in New York's humidity. He told him to get some rest and warned that if he planned any serious fisticuffs, he better lay off the whiskey for a day or two. Rudy followed through on his promise to return to Chicago to accept his unnamed opponent's reply. While he made the one-day trip back to the Windy City, George remained in New York to bear the brunt of the added publicity from the Tribune flap. From his Rudolph Valentino Productions office at 1440 Broadway and from the sitting room of the Ambassador Hotel Suite, George worked into the wee hours of every morning. In addition to his usual workload of poring over invoices, paying bills, and dictating correspondence, he scheduled Rudy's Son of the Sheik appearances and fielded a barrage of press requests. He also juggled a myriad of more mundane but nevertheless critical tasks. He paid Rudy's New York bootlegger for a fresh supply of whiskey, and with Rudy then smoking almost 100 cigarettes a day, George stockpiled cases of Abdullahs around the suite. Other than his New York secretary, Estelle Dick, George was running the show as a harried army of one. He was so overwhelmed by the added stress of Rudy's challenge to the Chicago Tribune writer, he telephoned to be in Los Angeles to ask her to leave the children with a nurse and board the next train east. He told her that in addition to Rudy's scheduled appearances for the Son of the Sheik premieres, he had just accepted an invitation from the New York Evening Journal's boxing expert, Buck O'Neill, to spar a few exhibition rounds on the ambassador's roof. George was calling in the troops. When B. Alvin arrived in New York, she moved into the suite to assist her husband in bringing some order to the chaos. 
By then, the ambassador's switchboard was connecting so many calls to Rudolph Valentino's suite that an extra telephone operator was hired. That busy ambassador hotel suite consisted of two bedrooms, the Omens and Rudy's, which were located on opposite ends of an elegantly appointed sitting room. From the day George and Rudy arrived in New York, Rudy would spend a few nights in his bedroom. Continuing in the routine he'd instigated in Paris, he caroused through most nights, arriving just before dawn, to sleep through the heat of the day. For Gotham was deep in the throes of Son of the Sheik mania during the summer of 1926, and the breaking news that the star of the film was in town and spoiling for a fight was as welcome a distraction from Manhattan's dog days as an unexpected cool breeze. It was hard to miss all the hullabaloo, as Rudy's well-meaning fans goaded him on to victory. Despite his public saber-rattling behind the scenes, Rudy was exhausted and yielding to a meltdown of deadly proportion. Nevertheless, the son of the sheik kept up his very public appearances, and as rakish as ever, he fooled everyone. His image graced the covers of every fan magazine, and looking invincible as ever in his desert finery, news of the son of the sheik filled the front pages of every newspaper. His name received top billing on the guest list of all uptown parties. Zigfield Follies clambered for a moment of his time. Park Avenue playboys jockeyed for a position next to him in speakeasies, and the city's cultural illuminati devised chic soirees in his company. George and B. Allman, on the other hand, were worried. They knew there were too many mornings after and afternoons after when the star of the show felt considerably less than a million bucks. From their bedroom in the Ambassador Hotel suite, they were witnessing the personal toll of chic madness and kept their wary eyes on the comings and goings of Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. On the day Alberto, Ada, and Jean left on their journey home to Italy, Rudy, George, and B accompanied them to the docks along the Hudson River. It was the day after the overly publicized bout on the ambassador's roof with Buck O'Neill, and Rudy's face bore the evidence. Buck fared worse after taking several solid jabs from Rudy before a panicky George called a halt to the exhibition match. The Chicago Tribune writer was still cowering in silence behind his scathing editorial, but Rudy was confident he'd succeeded in showing him that he packed a mean punch. Even if his opponent never surfaced, Rudy felt his exhibition match demonstrated to the world that anyone else daring to refer to him as a pink powder puff might soon feel his fist on their jaw as well. It was a brief but visibly emotional farewell between Rudy and Jean. The boy said his tearful goodbye after a long hug from Rudy. As Alberta was about to follow his wife and Jean up the ocean liner's gangplank, he paused and pulled George aside to ask him for money. He said he'd just asked Rudy for cash, but his brother told him he wouldn't give him, quote, another damn dime. George shoved his hand deep in his pocket and told Alberto that he was tapped out. B. Ullman overheard this exchange, and before Rudy knew any transaction had taken place, she handed Alberto $100 in small bills. With this coin in his pocket, Alberto was up the gangplank and headed home to Italy. George was surprised by Rudy's lackluster goodbyes to his family, but thought this was probably due to his eagerness to head out of the crowd and back to his bed in the ambassador's suite. With sirens blaring and banners fluttering, the great ship began its slow ease out into the Hudson River, just as Rudy spotted his brother standing on deck. Alberto stood alone and gave a wave in his brother and the omen's direction. With a half-hearted shrug, Rudy said to George, There he goes. I hope I never see the bastard again. Thanks for listening, and my next installment will be Chapter 16, titled Lost in the Woods. I hope you will subscribe to this podcast so you will be notified when the next chapter goes online. As always, you may find a copy of Affairs Valentino on Amazon and all online book-selling venues.